This book is a summary and analysis of Malcolm Gladwell entitled Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. These pages will cover the main points that the author makes, including thin slicing, subconscious prejudice, making snap decisions, reading facial cues, and utilizing the adaptive subconscious. The Theory of Thin Slices Malcolm Gladwell begins the first chapter of his book by relating the story of John Gottman, which pretty much serves as the perfect backdrop of what the book is all about. Gottman, a psychologist by profession, had a visit from a young couple whom the author hides under the pseudonyms Bill and Susan. The entire visit was videotaped and involved a short conversation between the couple. All the while, the couple was having what seemed like nothing more than a normal conversation, but were hooked up to machines that measured their heart rate and perspiration level. The recording was only 15 minutes long. Look at it, and it will be just Susan and Bill talking about something trivial. Dogs. Everything looked ordinary on the surface. But that 15 minutes were quite revealing. They actually helped Gottman predict with a 90% accuracy whether this couple would divorce in the coming years or not. Gottman's Research John Gottman already recorded thousands of other couples before Bill and Susan. They were all part of his study regarding how couples interact. Other than recording the entire back and forth of the couple, he correlated the information with the heart rate of each participant as well as the perspiration levels. Gottman believed that he could measure brief moments when the couple had a degree of conflict. He also factored in the facial expressions of the people who were interacting. Within just 15 minutes of data and uncanny analysis, Gottman was able to tell whether the couple being recorded would remain married in the next 15 years. That's how accurate he was. This method, Gladwell believes, is a good example of thin slicing. This is one of the key themes of Gladwell's book. Thin slicing is the method by which a human being's unconscious will make sense of the world around him. This applies the assumption that intuition is something empirical, something that you can measure. Remember that snap judgments don't need to take account of every piece of evidence. You only need a thin slice of the evidence to make your judgment, and you would be surprised at just how accurate you can be. How Gottman Does It Although Gladwell would usually point out in Chapter 1 that experts and those with necessary training are perhaps the only ones who can do thin slicing, it should be noted that right near the end of the chapter, he inserts a small bit of detail that anyone can actually do it. Well, not as good as Gottman, but to a certain degree, which can become quite useful. Anyone can do thin slicing since everyone's been doing it since day one. Here are some of the things that Gottman was able to observe during the videotaped conversation between Bill and Susan. Gottman argues that there are subliminal ways on how couples argue. It isn't always a direct confrontation, and what is usually hidden away is the stuff that is most telling. For instance, Bill would seem to reply in the affirmative, seeming to agree with Susan. However, after agreeing with her, he would jab in a but in his statements, thus effectively contradicting what she said. This is just one of the many small ways people show their contempt. Finding these small yet seemingly insignificant details is at the heart of the matter. It's not just the words that people use that give them away. Another way is through body language, ergo the videotape. Gottman would observe not only the words used by each participant in his interviews, but also check how they expressed these words. It's not just the tone, mind you. What he was actually looking for was specific forms of body language. In Susan's case, there were several times when she would roll her eyes when she made a point, or she would also do it when Bill said certain things. One example was when Bill asked her to give him credit for that time when he did take care of their dog. Not only did she not give him credit for it, she also rolled her eyes, which was quite telling. On top of that, there were other actions that were missing in what you would imagine to be a loving couple. There were no actions that showed a degree of positive reinforcement. Susan never nodded, smiled, nor gave any of the actions that you would hope to be in the affirmative. To the eyes of the untrained, this was just a couple talking about dogs, nothing more. If you knew exactly what to look for, you would see that this was a couple that had a lot of tensions in their marriage. Gottman would later conclude that this couple would one day head to divorce. Signs, Cues, and Patterns you may not end up as good as Gottman, but you can figure out the signs. Gottman was looking for reinforcement techniques being applied, facial cues, patterns, and other subtle signals that you would otherwise miss. Note that Gottman wasn't the first to use this methodology. 
it would appear that this technique or strategy was implemented during World War II. Back in those days, British intelligence personnel would listen to the German broadcasters. The goal wasn't to decode the message they were broadcasting. What they were doing was to determine distinctive fists or patterns as the codes were being broadcasted. They didn't need to decode the message. All they needed to do was to identify who was speaking. These British spies have become so familiar with the fists of different broadcasters that they could tell who it was and where they were located. Well, at least where in Europe. That also gave away the position of the Germans and where they were headed. The same thing is true with married couples, according to Gottman. Couples exhibited certain speech patterns and patterns in their behavior. These interaction patterns, a.k.a. the fists, would be your guiding light. In his practice, Gottman actually looks for four indicators or problem spots in any conversation. They include the following. Contempt. Criticism. Stonewalling. Defensiveness. All four of these predictors or signs are, of course, negative, but Gottman was only looking for one with particular intent, contempt. This is the indicator that tells if the couple will last. Now, why is that? Gladwell explains that contempt is one of the conversation styles that can reveal deep-seated problems in any relationship. However, you might say that stonewalling, criticism, and defensiveness also reveal some relationship issues and problems, right? What has been observed so far is that, sure, partner showing contempt is a negative, but this is one of the problems or telltale signs that don't last that long. The Power of Short, Quick Evaluations Analyzing a thin slice of evidence, according to Gladwell, is far better than getting a lot of data or information about the subject being observed. Why is that? Right off the bat, it removes any prior bias or preconceived notion that one may already have. There is psychological research and evidence that affirms and suggests this conclusion. The example, presented in Chapter 1, is that of one psychologist who asked different people to assess the personality of different students by simply observing their dorm rooms. Both friends and strangers were asked to guess the personalities of the students. Guess who made the more accurate assessments? It was the strangers who didn't know a thing about the students. The close friends of the students being assessed already had a preconceived notion, which clouded their judgment. However, the complete stranger can draw a pretty accurate assessment with very little data involved. In the case of this experiment, just info that could be gathered from the students' living spaces. This is one reason why thin slicing is so effective. It basically bypasses the human mind's tendency to stereotype things. For instance, Gladwell presents the image of a muscular football player. You can't accurately judge the man's IQ right then and there because of the usual bias that we have because of the preconceived stereotype we have already made for athletes of the same stripe. Take away the preconceived notions and stereotyping and check out the huge collection of books which he has in his room. Who would ever think that all of them belong to a muscular athlete? These are the fists of behavior that can be found within the student body. There are fists of behavior that can give us conclusive cues about the personality of people from different backgrounds, and thin slicing is quite a remarkable tool that will lead you on. The notion of thin slicing, new as it may sound, is not actually a novel idea. It is interesting that the concept can be found in a variety of professions. For instance, the concept or practice of thin slicing is also evident in the French military, which they call the power of the glance. A general in that army is expected to be able to judge the right strategy with just a moment's glance at the state of the current battlefield. On another occasion, Brian Grazer told of a story of his first time meeting with the young Tom Hanks. In that brief meeting, within a few seconds, Grazer was able to tell that Hanks would one day make it big in the movie and film industry. That is the power of thin slicing. It's not just for experts. You can capitalize on it if you know how. The Locked Door what is locked door? You'll find out after you get to the end of chapter two. Malcolm Gladwell begins the second chapter of his book with what seems to be a common method he would use to introduce certain concepts in his writing. He begins with a new example of one person exhibiting the powers of the unconscious mind. However, the point he is making in this chapter isn't the same one he was making in the previous chapter. The focus of this one is in that locked door. Why is it locked, and why should it be kept locked will be answered in due course. The Powers of the Intuitive Mind Gladwell introduces us to one of the best tennis coaches in the world, Vic Braden. 
Braden is well known for being able to tell when a tennis player will commit a double fault. A double fault in tennis means a player fails to serve the ball to start the game twice in a row. You can say that his ability to predict this is so uncanny that he is always right 20 out of 20 predictions. So, why is Braden able to do it with such accuracy? The answer that Gladwell provides us is that Vic Braden is well in touch with his very own adaptive unconscious. In the blink of an eye, he can use thin slicing to evaluate at a moment's notice whether a player will double fault or not. Why is the door locked? Now, we've already heard about all of this in the previous chapter, so why use another example? Well, the ability to use thin slicing isn't the point. Vic Braden and his ability to predict a double fault is no less than remarkable, no question about it. However, what seems to be equally interesting is the fact that he can't explain how he is doing it. Everyone can make snap judgments, that is a fact. You've been thin slicing even before you became aware that you were doing it. It is a natural function of your unconscious. Just like everyone else, when asked how you know what you know, especially after proving that you are right, comes the hard-crushing reality that your best explanation just sounds like mist dissolving into thin air. Gladwell explains that when people make snap judgments, it is often performed behind a closed door of sorts. He uses the term, the locked door. The door is locked, and not even you can open it. That is why when people are asked to explain how they know what they know instinctively, their explanations rarely come out as something convincing. Gladwell then argues further that it is an exercise in futility when people pay attention only to rationality with such exclusiveness. And why is that? The answer, of course, is that you are ignoring intuition altogether. He even argues that people should respect the fact that people can know something without actually knowing what they know. Another example of this phenomenon is during speed dating. Psychologists Fisman and Iyengar conducted experiments that utilized speed dating. The goal of the experiment was to determine if a person's idea of a romantic partner was the same as the real-world preference. The result of their experiment is that people really don't know what they want. The type of person one thinks that he or she is attracted to is rarely the same as the type of person one is actually attracted to. The Concept of Priming In the next section of Chapter 2, Gladwell introduces a new concept known as priming. This is some sort of preconditioning that can be performed on people which can influence how they behave and think. The process is rather simple. All you need to do is use subtle cues and stimuli to influence another person. You can say that it is somewhat similar to a magician using words, actions, and images when he is performing a prediction act, say making you choose a number from 1 to 10. Any type of stimuli can be used as a primer. You can use images, words, actions, music, and others. In the field of psychology, Primers are used carefully when studies are conducted. They are well-placed and controlled. This should also open your mind to a certain fact. You are being primed subconsciously every day. We are all bombarded by stimuli day in and day out without us ever noticing. Gladwell describes another experiment to illustrate the concept of priming. The experiment involved sending students to a professor's office. While there, they were asked to read what would appear to be just random phrases and sentences. Some of the text didn't even look coherent or meaningful at all. However, the phrases and sentences that the students read were actually stimuli or primers. They included certain words like old, gray, and others. These words were triggers that were calculated to make students walk more slowly. What was the effect? The students who participated in the experiment walked slowly that day. Further studies also suggest that these triggers can be used to influence people to behave in certain ways, such as being rude or polite. It's not brainwashing. For all the things that it can do, priming is not brainwashing. For instance, priming can be used to coerce people to perform complex tasks or actions. However, priming can be used to improve or reduce the performance of individuals. One case that Gladwell suggests in his book is in the graduate school admission test. For the longest time, there has been what is called an achievement gap between Caucasian students and African American students. There have been many theories that try to explain this phenomenon, of course. However, Gladwell in his book argues that it is nothing more than a case of priming. He cites the fact that students taking the GRE have to answer a pre-test questionnaire. 
In that questionnaire, they are asked to identify their race. Gladwell insists that the addition of such a question and others like it is a priming tool. It banks on the stereotype that Caucasian students are smarter and students of African-American descent are less smart. This, in turn, Gladwell argues, tends to make black students question and doubt their ability to perform well. Of course, this is only one of the possible reasons, and the phenomenon may be due to this and other factors. The solution, of course, which will help shed light on the matter, is to remove the racial questionnaire. Well, that is one way to illustrate how priming can improve the performance of some folks and to induce the idea of poor performance to others. The Case for Free Will The author acknowledges the fact that priming in itself can be quite a disturbing fact. Well, basically, it challenges the idea of free will. You see, if priming is true, then we can construe that free will is nothing more than a mere illusion. That is to say that human beings are primed or conditioned towards certain behaviors. Of course, all of that is subject to debate, and who knows, there might be a middle ground. The Advantages of Adaptive Unconscious There are advantages to priming and the adaptive unconscious. One of the advantages is the fact that your adaptive unconscious is like an autopilot system that automatically adapts the body according to the cues provided for in the surrounding environment. The adaptive unconscious takes care of the chore of interpreting stimuli so that the conscious mind can concentrate on the main problem, which is more important. It is also that part of your mind that sorts through the huge amount of information. Given that, it can be said that the adaptive unconscious is a time-saving part of your mind. In some instances, it, which includes your own instincts, can even save your life. Of course, being able to weigh the evidence consciously is important. However, there are times when an impulse like judgment is needed. A good example of this is during an emergency or perhaps during a crisis. Your adaptive unconscious can quickly translate thoughts into actions, enabling people to act fast. The Locked Door This and other experiments only prove that there are limits when you try to find a rational explanation to human behavior. Included in that category is thin slicing. People are often ignorant of the actual things that either affect or dictate their actions. Nevertheless, they rarely feel ignorant about it. Everyone seems to have a rational explanation of why they behave in a certain manner, even though such reasons may seem unbelievable at times. Gladwell suggests that there are certain types of human behavior that are better kept behind what he calls a locked door. The Warren Harding Error Who is Warren Harding? In the previous two chapters, Gladwell wrote highly of thin slicing as a tool that allows people to judge things correctly and with a high rate of accuracy. In this chapter, he proposes that the system isn't perfect. There are times when the adaptive unconscious can make mistakes. The Road Towards the Worst Presidency It was the year 1899 when Warren Harding, then vying for the presidency of the United States, and Harry Doherty, a lawyer and political fixer, had a meeting that would later change the course of history in the next few years. Warren Harding was then a candidate for the seat at the Ohio State Senate. However, Doherty believed Harding was meant for a higher position in the political race. What was Doherty's cue? How did he know all this? It was Harding's handsome face and charisma. This race for the presidency was suggested, and you can bet your bottom dollar that Harding ate it like his favorite pie from his mother. If you would care to check the paper trail, Harding didn't seem to be something special. He didn't even look like presidential material. On the one hand, he wasn't really that smart. He never really distinguished himself either as an editor for the paper that he was already working on or as a politician. On top of that, he had a heckler of a record when it came to having affairs with women. So, the question at the time was, how was it that Warren Harding was able to secure higher positions in government? During his terms, he never passed any significant laws or authored any legislation that was notable. Yes, he won that seat in the U.S. Senate, but he never made himself quite memorable. Well, that is if you stick with the papers. What was Harding's secret? Well, it was just exactly as Doherty said. First, Harding looked great. He appeared to be quite a charismatic leader. On top of that, there was a master puppeteer behind him. He had Doherty pulling the strings on the sidelines, and that was the secret to his success. Did he run for president? Of course, he did. Did he win, though? Yes, he did. 
and he would go down in American history as one of the worst presidents the country has ever had. Why did people vote for him? It was just as Doherty said. He looked like a charismatic leader, and that's all there was to him. Gladwell cites this example to prove a point, and that is that the adaptive unconscious with the human being's ability to thin-slice things when it comes to making decisions can be mistaken. Slices of the truth or not. This is an interesting contrast and a stern warning that Gladwell issues in Chapter 3 of his book. So far, he has talked about how effective thin slicing can be and how it can help you make snap decisions in an instant and be effective in life. Now, he turns the tables over to prove a very important point. The Warren Harding incident is a clear-cut example when the people's thin slicing of the truth is not completely the truth at all. In Gladwell's words, the slices that people take of the world aren't necessarily the slice of truth. Sometimes, what our instincts tell us can also be the wrong choice. Is it possible for people to base their decisions on bad evidence? The answer is yes. In the case of Harding, people jumped on the intuitive evidence that Harding could be a great president. He was a charismatic man, and people gravitated toward him. His ravishing good looks didn't just please the women. It won votes, just as Doherty predicted. The Mental Shortcut The next section of the book deals with something that we can label as a mental shortcut. This means that people tend to make rash judgments when they are in a hurry. That is, when the pressure is on, a lot of people will just make snap judgments based on stereotypes that they have formed through many years of experience. That is done in lieu of use of the rational mind. As an example, Gladwell makes use of a theory, and that is that people often use their adaptive unconscious toward bigotry. The implicit association test is a tool used by psychologists to test how quickly people jump to conclusions. In this test, people were given a list of words and were asked to divide the words on the list into different categories. The names of the categories, of course, were the controls that would measure the responses of the people participating in the experiment. One category that tested subjects encountered was men or careers. Interestingly enough, there was another category that was called women or family. It is interesting how fast people would complete the task that was given them when these were the categories that they had to choose from. What was more interesting was when psychologists switched things around. There was a second wave to the tests. This time, they would still do the same task of assigning words to different categories. However, the big difference was that the names of the categories had been mixed up. This time, the first category was men and family, and the second one was women and careers. What was the net result? During this second round, the test subjects found it more difficult to categorize each of the words. It took them longer. It was concluded that people had certain stereotypes that were rather sexist in nature. It is also equally interesting that we cling to such stereotypes, even though we claim we are not sexist, racist, or whatnot. The IAT test mentioned earlier proves that we, human beings, have strong preconceptions about age, gender, and race, among other things. These preconceptions can influence how fast we make snap judgments. The Natural Irrational Prejudice There are other examples that can be used as evidence to show that our adaptive unconscious can be irrationally prejudiced. For instance, during job interviews, it has been found that interviewers tend to favor taller candidates, which meant that applicants who are taller tend to have better chances of getting hired. So, what is the average physical profile of the American CEO? They are generally males and are about six feet tall. Now, it is true that the average American businessman is not consciously a racist, And Gladwell isn't saying otherwise. However, it can't be denied that there is an unconscious bias in favor of tall, white men. Breaking the Bias and the Warren Harding Error Gladwell closes this chapter with a section on how to overcome the Warren Harding Error and that irrational prejudice that would seem so natural to all of us. He directs the reader's attention to Bob Gollum, who at one time was a phenomenal car salesman. Gollum was the sales director of a Nissan car dealership in the town of Flemington. Gollum, for his part, was able to sell 20 cars in a month, which is more than twice the number of cars that can be sold by an average car salesman. So, how was he able to do it? Gollum used thin slicing, but he was able to avoid the initial prejudice, judgment, and stereotypes that people usually have. 
He claims that he paid attention to more than just the appearance of the person walking up to buy a car. Yes, he can size a person very quickly. Yes, he pays attention to their age, race, gender, and height. However, he also considers the other superficial cues that a client is giving away, such as their facial expressions, mannerisms, and other reactions. It turns out that a lot of car dealerships at the time suffered the same problem, since their salesmen were making wrong judgments practicing the Warren Harding problem. They offered white men $200 less than the initial offering. Given the results of this study, car dealers are racists. But that is not exactly the point that Gladwell was making here in this chapter. Note that most car dealers are not overtly or even consciously racist. They may even identify as not being one. Nevertheless, when they make snap judgments, that is, when they are placed under pressure, by their own doing, they invalidate personal beliefs about themselves and their claims. Nevertheless, Gladwell also points out something equally important. In the case of Bob Gollum, we have a clear example of the possibility to practice thin slicing the right way. That is the point that Gladwell is trying to make. There is a right way to use our adaptive unconscious, and there is also a wrong way to thin slice. Paul Van Riper's Big Victory In the next chapter of Malcolm Gladwell's book, he introduces Paul Van Riper. He is a veteran of the Vietnam War and another fine example of how to use snap judgments and improvisation. These are skills that he used as elements in his successful career as a soldier and commander. Millennium Challenge In the year 2000, the U.S. military conducted what was dubbed as the Millennium Challenge. It was a war game, albeit a really expensive war game. The theme of the said military exercise was that the army would go against a military commander in the Middle East. You may be able to deduce by now, given years of hindsight, that this military exercise was in anticipation of the coming Gulf War with Saddam Hussein. The Millennium Challenge was quite notorious in military history and strategy. In more than one way, it was a prediction of the coming war in Iraq. Other than that, it also demonstrated that careful and well-thought-out battle plans aren't the only potent elements of a successful military strategy. There are times when perfect information will interfere with practical decision-making strategies. The big point here is that there are moments, such as war, where having too much information can be bad for you. The military men who participated in the said war game stayed in Suffolk, Virginia for more than two weeks. Paul Van Riper was designated as the leader of the Red Team, in other words, the enemy, while on the other hand, the other U.S. generals took part as leaders of the Blue Team, in other words, Team USA. That's basically how war games are set up in the Pentagon. The battles they engaged in were highly realistic, but of course yielded no casualties. This military exercise yielded some very interesting results. The blue team used a tool they called Operation Net Assessment. This was a procedure that broke down every military decision into several factors, including political, social, and economic. On the other hand, Van Riper had to rely on his experience, wit, and spontaneity. Needless to say, Van Riper's team was equipped with something far more important, improvised, as well as unpredictable tactics. To cut the story short, Van Riper and his red team won decisively, in spite of being outnumbered by the opposing team. Why did he win? Let's break that down, shall we? Blue team relied heavily on deliberation and took the time to gather perfect information. They tried to predict red team's moves given the huge collection of information that they had with them. The exercise proved that not only was ONA unable to correctly predict Red Team's movement and overall strategy, it had severely failed at creating the optimal battle strategy as was hoped for. Van Riper had unpredictability on his side. He viewed the battlefield and used his battle instincts as he gave orders to his men on the field. Sure, Blue Team was able to destroy the majority of their communication system, but Van Riper devised a complex communication code that was rather impromptu and improvised. Blue Team system wasn't able to decode the system that Red Team was using. In short, Red Team was able to override Blue Team's predictions. Red Team was even able to destroy the huge majority of Blue Team's aircraft and ships. They literally crushed the enemy in spite of their lack of numbers. Aftermath of the Millennium Challenge To their discredit, Pentagon leaders decided to reset the war game. The ships that were sunk, in other words, took out of the game, as well as the aircraft that were taken out of play, were returned to their operative states before Red Team launched their attack. On top of that, the Blue Team leaders that Van Riper's team had assassinated were made unkilled. 
Furthermore, Van Riper was forbidden to improvise on this game reset mode. So what was the end result in the eyes of the Pentagon officials? Eventually, after all the restrictions were made on Van Riper's team, Blue Team won and the Pentagon celebrated their victory. Months later, this very scenario became real life when Saddam Hussein started to move in the Middle East. The Pentagon under the Bush administration made use of what they believed to be a successful combat platform, ONA. They used the same tool to try and win the war in Iraq quickly and decisively. In fact, the Pentagon began to plan early on how to attack and depose Hussein. They thought it would be easy, since they had planned deliberation and perfect information on their side. We all know that things didn't go as planned due to two elements, spontaneity and randomness, things which Van Riper emphasized all along. The big problem that they had in the Iraq war was that there was no reset button and the enemy could improvise as they wish. Goldman's Diagnosis Algorithm It should be clear now that having too much information can, at times, prevent you from being successful, especially during critical situations. It may cause you to overthink things and block your honed instincts from hinting at something wrong. The same is true in the case of Brendan Riley and the Cook County Hospital back in 1996. The hospital was understaffed and underfunded. Riley introduced an algorithm developed by Lee Goldman, which allowed the hospital staff to treat heart patients efficiently. The algorithm utilized a diagnosis that required fewer questions to be asked to the patients. This contradicted what doctors initially wanted to do. It was a life-or-death situation, and most doctors would want to have as much information as possible in order to create the best diagnosis. Goldman's algorithm was implemented only in half of the hospital staff. The other half proceeded as usual. What was the net effect? Those who used Goldman's algorithm were able to diagnose patients successfully 95% of the time, while those who used the old method only diagnosed patients correctly 80% of the time. Riley wanted his hospital staff to make decisions using only a limited amount of information, such as the patient's medical history, specifically regarding heart disease, ECG readings, and a few others. This allowed the staff to practice thin slicing. They cut down everything to the bare minimum and were still able to do the job successfully. Their performance was even better if you check the numbers. They were able to avoid overthinking the diagnosis and treat ER patients quickly, effectively saving lives. The Case of Joseph Kidd In another experiment, there was a group of psychologists who were asked to evaluate Joseph Kidd's mental health, another war veteran highlighted in Gladwell's book. The psychologists who participated were given varying information levels on the patient. Some had the bare minimum, while others had more. Some of the doctors present were given the patient's medical records. There were doctors who were given records to the extensive interviews that were conducted on Kidd's parents. Others were even provided with detailed information about the man's experience during his service in the Army. So who was able to better accurately predict Kidd's mental state? The answer is everyone did. The lesson learned here is in the medical exercise is the same point that Gladwell is making in the entire chapter. Having more information is not always the better option, especially when you are faced with a tough decision. At times, when people are fed too much information, it makes them irrationally confident when they make their decisions. Come to think of it, a doctor that eventually makes a poor diagnosis, all the while thinking that he or she is right simply because he or she is armed with a ton of information, is probably going to cause more harm than good. A doctor who isn't completely sure whether the diagnosis is correct or not is definitely more open to adjustments and is better able to change their opinion, in other words, be less close-minded, which makes that medical professional or any professional for that matter, more dynamic. Striking a balance. There are two important lessons that can be learned in this chapter. Please do not make the mistake of assuming that Gladwell is putting too much emphasis on using our human instincts. He is not saying that rationality is the weaker option compared to instinctively finding answers. What he points out rather cleverly in this chapter is that we as human beings need to balance between making rational, and well-informed decisions and intuition. In fact, when it comes to decision-making, especially when the situation is critical, it is better to include elements. Well, a rather healthy mix of both intuition and rationality. The enemy, or the roadblock as it were, that Gladwell is pointing out here is excessive information. That will usually interfere with one's intuition, thus inhibiting your natural ability to thin-slice at any given moment. 
Too much deliberation may sound good, but it makes you overconfident and blind to other factors that could have been critical to the decision-making process. Kenna's Dilemma In Chapter 5 of his book, Gladwell covers the practice of polling and uses the experience of musical artist Kenna to explain certain important points. In this chapter, Gladwell demonstrates through different examples how expert opinion, polls, and test audience opinion can vary sometimes. It should be highlighted at the onset that Kenna's music is rather complex. It doesn't fit squarely in any single musical genre. You can almost say that it is a genre in its very own. Kenna was discovered by a talent scout who then referred him to Atlantic Records president Craig Kalman. Kalman's day-to-day -day responsibilities included the excruciating task of listening to hundreds of songs and making snap decisions whether a song or artist would likely be a hit or not. The good news is that when Kenna's music was reviewed by Kalman, he knew immediately that the song was going to be a hit. He then arranged for that artist to meet key figures in the industry, which included music producers and such. The musicians who heard his music, the producers, and top executives loved his music. They all approved that Kenna was going to be a huge musical star one day. Kenna even got good reviews from music critics and music reviewers. However, there was one problem. The public didn't like him. The Problem with Polling Just as Gladwell had done in the previous chapters of his book, he demonstrates how the act of explaining one's instincts, or at least trying to, can interfere with one's decisions. Here in this chapter, he describes what would seem to be a problem with data or information retrieved from polls. Note that when people are polled, they are usually asked to explain why they selected said option. However, polling is a tool, a useful tool, and Gladwell doesn't take that part away from it. For instance, polling can be quite a useful tool when politicians try to appeal to constituents. So, what is the inherent problem with polling anyway? Gladwell answers that it is the act of making the people explain the choice. Sure, they can choose a response, but they will find it hard if they try to explain why they chose that option. This means that we should take the poll results with a grain of salt simply because there are times when people just don't know exactly what they want to say or they just don't know what they really want. New Coke or Old Coke Next, Gladwell uses the Pepsi vs. Coke feud as an example of the flaws of polling and making people explain their instinctive choices. The rivalry between Coke and Pepsi has gone on for decades. Back in the 70s, Pepsi introduced what they called the Pepsi Challenge. In this challenge, random folks were blindfolded and were made to drink from two small cups. One cup contained Coke and the other cup contained Pepsi. They were asked to choose which drink they liked and then their choice was revealed to them. Pepsi led the polls in that challenge by a slim margin. However, that margin was statistically significant. It was so significant that Coke took a lot of measures to distinguish themselves from Pepsi back in the 1980s. As a response to Pepsi's growing influence on the market, Coca-Cola released a new product, which they called New Coke. They had a panel of tasters, and New Coke fared very well with a test sample from the population of Coca-Cola customers. However, when they released the product to the market, New Coke wasn't accepted very well by the public in general. What happened next? Well, Coke had to reintroduce its original product, which was called simply as Coke, but they had to rebuild the brand, and so they called it Classic Coke. Guess what was the end result? Classic Coke, even though it was the same old product, sold very well. Surprisingly, Coca-Cola finally solved a long-standing problem. They were not only able to differentiate themselves from Pepsi, but they also beat Pepsi in its own challenge. Now, this is a classic example of how the populace doesn't really know what they want. After that, Gladwell points out a few problems with what the executives thought was the result of the Pepsi challenge. The top brass at Coca-Cola thought that the Pepsi challenge proved to the masses that people really loved Pepsi more than Coke. The fact is that the challenge never proved such an assumption. What the Pepsi challenge really proved is that when people were blindfolded, they liked a small amount of Pepsi more than a small amount of Coke. You see, there are other versions of the Pepsi challenge. In one version, test subjects were made to take home both a case of Pepsi and a case of Coke. The end result is that, sure, people liked a small amount of Pepsi, but when it came to volume consumption, people preferred to drink Coke rather than Pepsi. They practically drank the contents of the entire Coke case, 
while there were plenty of leftovers from the Pepsi case. One problem we can see with polls here, other than people not being able to actually express what they want to express during the explanation part of a poll, is that we sometimes misinterpret the data provided by the polls. This may be another case of getting too much information and allowing the overabundance of data to cloud our judgment. Sensation Transference Malcolm Gladwell then introduces the notion of sensation transference through the success of advertiser Louis Cheskin. Cheskin was an advertiser and he was truly revolutionary in his marketing efforts. So, what is sensation transference? Cheskin explains that he has observed in his profession that people often transfer the impressions that they get from one product's packaging to the actual product that is in the package. For instance, they had a problem advertising margarine, which the public viewed as a cheap version of butter. The public wouldn't buy it. So, what did Cheskin's team do? They repackaged margarine in fancy, shiny, gold-looking packaging. The result was that people began to think that margarine was something fancy. Well, look at it. It has all this nice packaging, so it must be a valuable product. Or so they thought. Cheskin and his research started a revolution. Hundreds of companies followed suit and began to revamp the way they packaged their products. If there was a new packaging method or perhaps a new kind of advertisement was developed, hundreds of companies also followed suit. An example of which is the occurrence of the semi-realistic food mascots, which is another pioneering achievement of Cheskin and his team. Note that mascots of this type have been influential in part in the boosting of the sales of canned goods in the previous decades. Now, can we say that Cheskin's marketing strategies are fraudulent or at least somewhat dishonest? Gladwell counters this suggestion by saying that this marketing strategy is no different from advertising and charging more for so-called new chocolate chip cookie that only has larger chocolate chips than the previous product that was offered to the market. The case in point. People will eventually pay more for a product because they think and firmly believe it is going to taste better. Well, sometimes all it takes is to make them think the product does taste better. In other words, using better and more sophisticated packaging, a single bigger ingredient, etc. Furthermore, we can also observe that people usually decide the taste of a product not just by how a product tastes like, People will judge a product by how it looks and will also say it tastes good because it is able to trigger certain feelings and memories. Different equals bad. The Aeron chair is maybe one of the most common chairs today in the office. It was introduced by the Herman Miller Company back in the 1990s. Back then, it was a new and different product and people said they didn't like it during surveys with test audiences. Test audiences had never seen the like of it before. When asked if the chair was comfortable, which was what the Aeron chair was primarily designed for, they said that it was absolutely comfortable. It even provided the right amount of support for the shoulders and the rest of the body. So, what did the test audience hate about it? The answer? It was hideous. It didn't look like the elegant, throne-like chairs that you will see in the manager's office. The test audience said it was awful, and Herman Miller either had to make major changes to the product, which would entail a huge lot of money, or just don't introduce the product to the market. They did neither of these options. They introduced the product to the masses, and they loved it. This is a classic case that Gladwell has been pointing out all throughout this chapter, that there is a gap between what they think or say that they like and what they actually do like. There are, at times, a difference between the results you get from polling and popularity. So, why did Kenna fail? Gladwell suggests the following as probably the reason why Kenna failed to sell his music in spite of getting good reviews from producers and other professionals. Gladwell concludes that he didn't sell simply because the marketers focused too much on the music and not so much on selling Kenna. It's pretty much the same issue with Coca-Cola. The marketers focused too much on the taste, but when they changed the packaging, their product took off to the stars, so to speak. The same can be said about Kenna. If the marketers took the time to package and truly market Kenna, then his career and market might have taken off in a different direction. Seven Seconds in the Bronx Malcolm Gladwell concludes his book with a tragic example of how snap judgments can be made erroneously. He tells the story of Amadou Diallo and the four police officers who killed him. It was a night in February in the year 1999 and Diallo, an immigrant from Guinea who knew very little English, was standing outside his South Bronx apartment. 
While there, four police officers drove by and thought they were looking at a burglar who was trying to break into an apartment. Diallo was looking left and right as if checking if the coast was clear or something. So, the four officers approached Diallo. On top of that, the man fit the description of a serial rapist who had been reported to be roaming the neighborhood. Upon seeing the four guys in plain clothes approach him, Diallo remembered the incident that involved his friend, who had been attacked by armed robbers. So, what would you expect he'd do? Diallo ran. Well, he ran towards his apartment, that is. The police officers, who were in civilian clothing, pursued him but were entering a tight hallway. Immediately, the situation became tense. They yelled for the black man to stop running, but he kept on running. All of a sudden, one of the officers thought he saw Diallo carrying a gun. It was in fact his wallet, and he might have been trying to give it up to the four guys he thought were trying to rob him. One of the officers opened fire upon seeing what he thought was a firearm. The others followed suit after hearing the gunshot. Diallo died right then and there. Gladwell argues that the officers might have reacted out of confusion rather than out of prejudice against a black man. They made four mistakes during this encounter. One, it was a case of mistaken identity because they thought Diallo was a suspected rapist. Gladwell and this particular book being summarized and analyzed were criticized because this particular error was not covered well, lightly if any at all. Some, of course, argued that this was a case of racial prejudice. Two, they chased Diallo into a narrow hallway, which was headed towards Diallo's apartment. Three, one officer shot the man because he thought he was reaching for his pistol or concealed firearm. Four, the other officers thought the gunshot injured their comrade and thus opened fire, resulting in Diallo's death. One argument about this incident is that it is another case of conscious racism. Of course, that is arguably the case, but it couldn't be proven. Nevertheless, it can be a possible cause of the poor snap decision made on the part of the police officers, even if they were not openly or admittedly racist. Facial Cues However, this chapter is not about racism or bad thin slicing. In this final chapter, Gladwell dedicates to reading facial cues. Interpreting facial expression is a round trip back to the first chapter. One of the most common uses for our adaptive unconscious is making snap judgments about other people. Glanwell argues that human beings are naturally able to pick up facial cues that are rather subtle. We can easily notice and figure out brief displays of emotion. The four police officers in the Diallo case were acquitted by a jury. The basis of the acquittal was the fact that they made some bad but forgivable mistakes. Of course, that outraged a lot of people. Some even believe that the incident was textbook police racism. We can deduce from the manner that the police officers who were involved made mistakes when they interpreted Diallo's facial cues. The Variableness of Human Free Will Gladwell's subtle point here in this chapter is rather provocative. He argues that human beings can also make choices unconsciously. He further argues that people could be conditioned to act involuntarily. Again, this concept challenges the idea of human free will. Gladwell argues that man's freedom of choice is a shifting gray area. Our freedoms and freedom of choice will usually depend on the situation at hand. In other words, the actions we make are sometimes voluntary to some degree, and at other times they are involuntary. In the case of the four police officers involved in Diallo's case, their decisions also fall within this gray area of human free will. It is a fact that these men never had any previous history of behaving in an overtly racist way. It would even seem like they openly accept people as they are, without regard for race, creed, nor any other background. This is the one incident when they might have fallen back on their racial stereotypes, but it can also be argued that they misread the facial cues from Diallo. Studies on Facial Action Units Again, Gladwell makes a full turnaround going back to the points he made on the first chapter with Gottman, but this time in the sixth chapter. He cites the works of other experts, such as Paul Ekman and Sylvan Tompkins. Note that the research of Tompkins and Ekman pretty much makes the same points and provides the same findings as the experiments conducted by John Gottman. From their combined research, it is suggested that the face in pretty much the entire human body speaks a subtle language. In fact, the face betrays our pretensions and reveals our actual emotions. It seems that you can't hide what you really want to say when your facial cues give you away. Ekman and Tompkins, like Gottman, developed a system, a fairly sophisticated and complex system that is, 
to read even the faintest facial cues. They videotaped thousands of subjects trying to understand every possible facial cue that human beings make. They have compartmentalized the movements of the facial muscles into a number of action units, which allowed them to analyze and understand human facial expressions. These action units were broken down by Ekman into facial expressions that were absolutely recognizable. Their research indicates that there are all in all 43 distinct action units, in other words, facial muscle movements. Human beings make hundreds of facial muscle combinations to produce what they call as affects, in other words, distinct facial expressions. For instance, fear is one of the most common facial affects or facial expressions that human beings make. Ekman and company affirm that the facial expression we show as fear is a combination of action units numbered 1, 2, 4, 5, and 20. Yes, they numbered each action unit for easy reference. So what are these facial muscle actions? Well, you may already know them already. They include a raised inner and outer eyebrow, eyelids raised, the jaw dropping, a stretched upper lip, and a wrinkled nose. If you tried to make the said facial expression following the action units described above, you should be able to make a really frightened face. There are hundreds of other combinations and they have been incorporated into their action unit research. Ekman and Company's research has hundreds of possible uses and practical applications. For instance, it can be used to analyze witnesses to determine what they truly intended to say and to identify if they are guilty of a charge or just blatantly lying. Another application of this research was in the case of the movie Toy Story. The animators of this movie series made use of the information provided by these action units to draw the movie characters and create very realistic facial expressions. There are actually a few interesting points that Ekman learned in his research. For instance, people think that facial expressions are used to express an internal emotional state. An example of which is that people smile when they are happy, a fairly natural thing to do. However, Ekman found out that people turn out to be happier when other people or events make them smile. Ekman also discovered that people communicate via micro-expressions. These are facial expressions we, human beings, make for only a fraction of a second. This was demonstrated when Harold Philby, a Soviet spy, was put on trial. On videotape, he looked perfectly in control of himself. But after analysis, it was found out that he exhibited guilt, fear, and distress through his micro-expressions. This, of course, proved that the man was definitely guilty of the things that he was charged with. Today, both the FBI and the CIA study the applications of the affect theory and facial cues to determine when an enemy of the state is lying or telling the truth. The face has a mind of its own. Going back to the case of Diallo and the four police officers, it should be asked if human beings are naturally good at determining facial cues. Why is it that these men failed to read Diallo's distressed facial cue? Now, here's a crucial point. It is possible that people can view the face and not glean any information, especially when one is in a high-stress situation, which was the case of the four police officers. Their heart rate skyrocketed to 175 beats per minute, which would elevate their stress levels. They failed to pick up on Diallo's expressions out of panic and fear. Situations with uncertainty and danger involved can dull people's capacity to read facial cues. Gladwell draws a parallel between this phenomenon and that of people with autism who have lost any ability to read facial cues. We sometimes enter such a state during a high-stakes situation, or, in other words, become temporarily autistic. To avoid all of this, Gladwell discusses ways to train oneself to counteract one's unconscious prejudice, among other things, that would dull one's ability to thin-slice. Like Gottman, Ekman, and Tompkins, Ordinary people can train themselves to become adept at thin slicing. I hope that the information here was able to help you get a primer of Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Note that we cannot include every single point that the author has made in his original work. This book is only meant to highlight some of the important lessons that can be learned from his work. The next step is to get a copy of Gladwell's book and pursue its pages at a slower and more concentrated rate. If you enjoyed this summary and analysis, then you will definitely enjoy the full work.